Don, tell me, um, you've got a lot of background for emergency services, um, and uh, tell us tell us about your memories of 9-11, and I guess uh, if you can, tell us about uh, when you first heard about it. Sure. Uh, September 11th that morning, I was uh, teaching a refresher CPR course at Ryerson University. Um, didn't know anything that was going on until I left, and I drove through the ghost town, which was downtown Toronto. Um, that's when I turned on the news and found out. So after checking on a couple of my clients to make sure that they were good, um, I went home, packed my stuff, and immediately made my way to the border to try to go across. Unfortunately, I made the mistake of saying what I was, <laughs> that I was actually going to heading to New York City. Uh, they turned me around and basically said, we don't need your help. Thank Wh you, though. Why did you want to go? I've been responding to disasters my entire career. Um, it's just the humanitarian relief is something I, that I've always been passionate about. It was just something I had to do. Um, I knew that there was people hurting, suffering, and I, I, it was just something I, I needed to go. Um, I, I lived in the States for quite a few years, uh, so I think it hit me harder because uh, it just was, that's, that's still my home. and it, uh, impacted me deeply that way. Um, so I, I made other plans, but three days later, I was able to cross the border, uh, made my way down uh, with a group of uh, firefighters from uh, Massachusetts, and got to the pile about five days after the plane set. Um, and what was, what was it like when you first saw the pile? And uh, forgive me, had, had you seen the World Trade Center before? Yeah, I had been to New York City a few times. So what, what yeah. um, but I, I was disoriented because all of my common landmarks either you couldn't see because of the smoke and the dust and the World Trade Center complex just was unrecognizable um, and the pile of stuff that was I guess it was organized confusion organized chaos um, I'm sure from above a satellite it was a bunch of ants running like crazy all over the place but it was organized confusion um, and we, we got assigned our, our roles, and my, my job was to look for, uh, for lack of a better way of saying it, parts um, for human remains, um, and sift through looking for both for personal items as well as for human remains, um, and going through that process. Give us an idea on how big this pile was. Like, uh, people see it and it's, in, you know, you don't know how high it was. Like, you're talking about 210 story buildings, but I mean, when they crumpled down, they were still, there's still a lot of height to them. Uh, I think a lot of people have vivid recollections of those primary walls where it was just the girders, almost forming a protective fence. Uh, that was the highest of the pile. Um, but literally I was working at street level up to 100, 200 feet above that, just climbing up on top of all this rubble. Uh, that's a lot of concrete uh, from buildings that size to, to climb up on. What was it like? eerie it was eerie but again this wasn't my first rodeo so I, I somewhat knew what to expect but it was still shocking and I think because people our age and younger have never experienced anything major that of, of devastation where North America we've never been attacked after uh, Pearl Harbor uh, so I think that shock was set through everybody. Everybody was just kind of going through the motions because we couldn't believe that this actually happened. Um, planes don't just fly into buildings on, on a daily basis. So I think that shock was was resonating even through all the first responders for, until en enough time had passed for us to digest it and then it became just about the job. And it was our job, it was just going through those motions that helped us cope because we knew right foot, left foot, right foot, left foot. And that was enough to get us through and, and at least functional uh, while, while we got more organized. How long were you there for? Three weeks. Um, Every day? Yeah. Where would you sleep? Uh, we were billeted uh, at a local school initially uh, and then some hotel rooms opened up. Uh, so they were able to find us a hotel uh, just outside near Flatbush. Now I know, did it play with your mind? Like, you know, like, you know, when I say that, because again, like, it's like everybody's not everybody, but I mean, you know, when you're with emergency services, you're, for lack of a better word, used to seeing bad things. But the proportion of this was beyond. 
Yeah, um, there were times where I broke down, um, and this is where and this is where I really came to appreciate the value of uh, service animals. Uh, there were search and rescue dogs as well as cadaver dogs, trained dogs to look for bodies and parts. Um, their handlers were awesome. They let me hold the dog during a break. I'd pour water on its paws because they were burning from the smoldering rubble. Uh, so they were whimpering because of their paws and I'm just pouring cold water on their paws and they're licking my face and I'm holding them and that's, that was when I allowed myself to break down. Um, and then break was over, dog went back to work, I went back to work. Um, but that's, this has been, that was the one incident that has really played the heaviest toll on, on me by way of my own uh, health wise. Um, Traditionally, I, I kind of go through uh, a bad phase every anniversary uh, with nightmares and things along that lines. But uh, it, it, I think anyone who is there um, is dealing with trauma. And it, I think everyone who witnessed it is dealing with trauma. The CNN effect, I call it, where you're constantly watching, re-traumatizing yourself over and over and over again. Um, that's going to have an impact on us as a society. That's, that's mental health issues there. Does it feel like 20 years? <laughs> It seems like a hundred and some days, and it seems like yesterday and others. Um, but the advancements I've seen in the emergency management profession since, um, we did get some great lessons from that event. Um, as much as the loss of life was tragic, uh, I, I, I try to buoy myself or bolster myself up, uh, just trying to look at what good came out of things, as opposed to focusing on all the, the bad crap, like the loss of life, like that, that's devastating. Um, but the emergency management profession actually firmed up, especially up here in Canada, where we saw a resurgence of interest in public safety. And a lot of the lessons the Americans learned, we applied them up here as well to strengthen our, our ability to respond to disasters up here. Everything from having a common incident management program across the country, uh, something as simple as that really was driven from the experience of having good communication tools uh, that was that was absolutely terrible. Both when they were going into the tower, they couldn't communicate, and the inability to properly co coordinate communications and public messaging. There, everybody, every entity was doing their own thing as opposed to a unified approach, and that's something else that uh, we've been able to adapt and learn. Now we've got emergency management degree programs, master's programs. Uh, there's some talk about a doctorate in emergency management. So this isn't lights and sirens. This is the actual managing of a crisis situation. There was hundreds of people though there though, like correct, like you know, helping like hundreds, if not more than hundreds. Yeah, but thousands. I mean, like, it would be huge to work to you know because it the moment the search and rescue and recovery starts is the second that they fell. Yeah. So it's like to get every to get thousands of people organized under one umbrella would be challenging and, even at this time like and, I would say and, even at this time yeah something of this size and magnitude it's not easy but if you have a plan and if you practice in advance um, and then you rewrite your plan based on the lessons you learn you're constantly tweaking you're constantly going through this cycle um, that's how you prepare for it um, there is no such thing as a perfectly managed emergency or a disaster uh, we will always be learning stuff but uh, we can have systems in place to better coordinate it regardless we might not know the exact details of what happened but with enough planning exercises um, and staying on top of it you can have an effective response tell me about if you can just sort of your day on any given day down there get up I made a phone call to uh, my girlfriend at the time. Um, that was the daily ritual because I wanted to start the day off positive. And literally it was meeting up with the guys and gals with the team, uh, grabbing breakfast. It was always cafeteria style. Um, or they had boxes prepared for us on the site. That was how we ate lunch. Uh, the New York business people were amazing. Uh, they would open up the restaurant if we showed them our pass and our ID or we show up covered in dust, they knew, um, and they'd give us a free lunch. Um, it was just their way of trying to say thank you for coming and helping. 
but that was something that really twigged on me. Um, it was the first time I really realized that I was witnessing the worst of humanity, but the best of humanity at the same time. And back then, New Yorkers had such a reputation of being tough as nails, uh, don't, don't mess with them type attitudes. And that changed overnight. Uh, the, we were all just human beings uh, trying to help each other out. Uh, they, were so, they didn't care if I was from Canada, they just knew I was there helping. So tell me about today when you got on scene. Um, tell me about the day, what, what a day in the life would be. Uh, it's literally getting on the pile and uh, grabbing the bucket. Are you assigned a certain area? Yeah. Uh, so there are grid, grid patterns are set up and you're assigned to a particular grid within the footprint of the building that you're assigned. And you work, you start working that area. And literally it, it could be handfuls of stuff going into a sifter and going through it to try to see what you're actually exposed to. Other times it's just really, really manual labor where you're picking up huge chunks of concrete, moving them off the pile so that you can get further into stuff. And then regularly stopping when somebody found something that was identifiable as human remains, um, such as an arm or a foot, um, then all work stopped. And basically it was carried discreetly through a path of us uh, to the coroner's tent for a forensics tent uh, where it was turned over for, for their begin their processing. Um, and then uh, after a moment of silence, then we get back to work. So it was, there, was those, there was regular stops of, of work for that just re respect and recognition. I was gonna say, if you can talk a little bit about the respect there, like you've got thousands of people working on this, acres and acres of uh, site buildings and uh, and yet, when something's found, stops, silence, yeah. and respect. And, and, and it had nothing to do with that this might be a firefighter. But this might be one of our brothers. Um, it, it had to do with human. This is a human life. And it needs to be honored and respected. And that was something that really did impress me, is that respect. Because it's easy to get into worker mode. And I did hear some disturbing questions about that a few weeks after the plane set saying well why don't we just take the bulldozers in it's like no the families deserve better than that and that was always top of mind is how do we what's the best way to take care of the families that are impacted by this by, by way of Americans in general but this is somebody's mom or dad um, we've got to respect that and that didn't stop that was the way it was the entire time I was there was it hard for you to leave yeah most disasters are you. Uh, you're, you're. It, it sounds trite, trite, but uh, you, when you're saving the world, it's tough to come home. Uh, when you're making a difference, and uh, it's it's tough. The adrenaline, you get used to it. You get almost hooked on it. You're you're, you're doing something. You come home, and it's anticlimactic. It's like, oh, okay. Um, what do I do now? Uh, so. It, sometimes it's easier to stay even though you burn yourself out it's easier to convince yourself to stay so this is where that's something I've learned in taking care of my teams after this is that you have to sometimes force people to go home you have to force them to stop because people will work 24 7 and kill themselves literally unfortunately um, because they, they they just want to keep helping what do you take away from that I love people, um, but I hate people. <laughs> uh, humanity is something that I've always wanted to be. Uh, I respect humanity. I think we've got so much potential and I've seen the power of humanity at work. Um, and that's what I have to keep focusing on. So this is something, there are bad people that are, are out to hurt, but that is a majority or a minority of the world. 90% of the population, I'm just throwing out a number, but 90, 95% 90, of the population are good, honest, family-loving, good people. And I don't care what country, religion you are, that's, that's the makeup of it. You've got this 5 or 10% of the world, though, that suck, uh, that don't care, and are selfish. And I just have to keep focusing on the 90% and not on that 10%, even though... They're the ones that sometimes they're the ones that cause me to go out and expose myself to this type of stuff. Tell me a little bit about, and I know I'm jumping back and forth, but tell me, tell me about the good that you saw down there. Like you mentioned the restaurant, 
restauranters giving you stuff. But I mean, tell me about the good of New York. Tell me about the good of oh, the it's, firefighters. It's the it's the pats on the back. Uh, you're, you're you know you're just walking down the street. People realize you're coming off the pile. They just come up and give you a pat on the back, saying thank you so much. It's like, dude, you're from New York. You're not supposed to be this friendly. <laughs> um, but then all of a sudden it just became normalized. Um, and all of a sudden everyone was getting along. The boroughs, there was no discussion about what borough is getting what help and what's not. And it was, there was just this really nice sense of oneness. Uh, and I guess that's the best way to describe it. Same thing with firefighters. There's a camaraderie, there's a, there's a sense of family already amongst first responders, but it really strengthened uh, there. And when I saw, quite often, there's a lot of, uh, fun rivalry between police, fire, ambulance. That was nowhere to really to be seen um, during that response. It was, it was no, we're all in this together. It doesn't really matter what uniform you're wearing. Um, but we did give a huge tip of our hat to the firefighters because they're the ones who suffered such a significant loss. 343, yeah. Yeah, and we lost paramedics. Uh, they don't get as much attention, but both cop, their cops, their firefighters, their medics, not to mention all the civilians. Uh -huh. um, but uh, we did see that good in people. Uh, and like I say, I think it was reassuring to see that we can actually operate as one people, regardless of nation of origin. God forbid if it ever happened again, do the same thing? I'd be there in a heartbeat. Um, I'm, I've been doing some work with different uh, volunteer organizations again. Uh, and I responded up to Thunder Bay, for example, to assist with the COVID response up there uh, back in March, uh, discussing uh, whether or not I could go get back to Haiti, um, get a little too old for this stuff. Uh, but I, if something bad happens, I'll be there. Um, if I, physically I can do it, I'll be there.